All right, good to have you all with us. We are continuing in Clashing Worldviews in the U.S. Supreme Court. We're going to talk about Chapter 3 and William Rehnquist, okay? We, we, we took a, about two, three weeks. We talked about a progressive Christianity with um, Harry Blackman, and now we're going to talk about more conservative Christianity with uh, William Rehnquist, okay? Now, when I want to say this, okay? Don't, if you've read the chapter and you read about William Rehnquist, he is a conservative Protestant, which is more in line with, again, as I'm recording this, I'm recording this at our church in a Sunday morning class, okay? And so we would be what we consider conservative Protestants, mm -hmm. okay? But Rehnquist came from, okay, we are conservative Protestants. We are evangelicals. Right. What are evangelicals? Okay, we believe in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. We believe that he died on the cross and for the sins of the world, and that unless you receive that and you become born again, you are not regenerated, you are not spiritually alive, you are disconnected from God. We believe in the miracles of the scriptures that are, you know, they really happened and they're true for today. You know, we believe that you have to serve Jesus and follow him faithfully. Okay? That, that's evangelical Christianity, okay? So, so Rehnquist was of that strain, but he's not of the Assemblies of God Baptist version that you're familiar with, okay? Because I just want to say this because I think you need, the guy smoked all his life. The guy drank. The guy um, was fond of playing poker with his buddies for money. Okay, certain things that as, as conservative evangelicals, some would frown and go, uh, uh, wait a minute. But okay, so, so as we're talking about this, we're painting in really broad brush strokes. We're not, we're, we're not fine tuning this. And so, so don't, so as we look at William Rehnquist, okay, don't think of him as an Assemblies of God, cons really, really conservative, okay, uh, in, in behavior kind of a person. He was a godly man. He was a prayerful man. It was not unusual for him on his lunch break to find a place to pray, and he'd find a Catholic church that was really close to the Supreme Court, and he would spend his lunches praying and seeking God. Okay, so he, this was a very devout man. Uh, th th this, this was a man that at the end of his life was in a really serious uh, uh, theology, theology class, okay? Uh, talking, I, I personally talked to his pastor, and he said, you know, this guy was, you know, this was a class that dealt with kind of the stuff that we're talking about in this class, you know, historicism and imminence and transcendence and, 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 and process theology and some of that intense stuff we got into. He was into that stuff and he studied it to the end of his life. But you don't pick, don't look at this guy as, hey, he's one of our guys and, and he's totally... Because he would be, he would look at our church service as an Assemblies of God church and be like, eh, that's a little too emotional for me. <laughs> He'd be much more com comfortable in a congregational type of a church, and yet a Bible believing, you must be born again church, but a much more conservative, when I say conservative, in his, you know, uh, he would not like the worship we have. Okay, he would be much more, much more akin to, let, let, let's, let's state the Apostles' Creed in the service, the Nicene Creed, let's sing from the hymn book. He would look at what we do on Sunday morning and go, um, that's not for me. Okay, so just, I want you to understand that because it's easy, and, and, and I'm saying this because, and I didn't personally write this chapter. I added some things in this chapter, but this is Sharina Arrington wrote this chapter, um, and she is a brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and so it, it's intense. But, but one of the things that she discovered and I discovered um, is just, again, you can't pigeonhole him into what you understand of evangelical Christianity. He was from a, a more of a congregational, uh, uh, Puritan-influenced Christianity, which is very disciplined, very ordered, very reserved in their worship. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so just, just so we understand that. Um, okay, so um, let me see if I can get this going. So, again, if, you, if you've read, have, have you all read the chapter? Some of it? Yes, yes, Any, yes. Anyone besides Joanna has read it or parts of it? Okay. Um, one of the things that they begin with is Rehnquist, um, as he developed his legal understanding, as he developed his political understanding, 
He drew from the classics. He drew from Aristotle. He drew from Cicero. Um, he drew from the Old Testament. And the understanding from the Old Testament, the understanding from even classical writers who weren't Christians, if you're going to set up a political system, you have to look at the nature of man. Okay? So, basically, anthropology precedes political philosophy. What does it mean to be human? Okay? Uh, a Renkus would embrace something that you embrace and you don't even know it, and it's something called Christian realism. What's Christian realism? Is that you look at the world realistically, and whether you know it or not, you take into account when you see a school shooting, when you see a tragedy, I don't know, a shipwreck, a hurricane, okay, pick your tragedy, you know, okay, Christian realism assumes at least two things. Number one, we live in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that is going to happen because humanity has rebelled against God and unleashed, okay, this, this idea of total depravity. There, there is depravity in the earth because of humans' decision to rebel against God in Genesis 3, okay? Rehnquist understood that very, very well. The second aspect of Christian realism you understand, but you may have never expressed this, is everyone's a sinner, okay? If you don't accept Jesus, well, and we are sinners saved by grace. Oh, but for the grace of God goeth I, right? And you, okay? So, so, so you're going to look at a political system. You're going to look at the law from the standpoint of you can't do law well, and you can't set up a constitution or a government or anything well. Unless you realize that humans are sinners. Okay? That was, that was Rehnquist's understanding of the law and how we understand. That, that's how the framers set up our Constitution. The, the, the Constitution with its separation of powers horizontally, right? You've got the, the, the legislative branch, the executive branch, judicial branch. And then the separation of powers vertically. That's called federalism. You've got the national government. You've got state government. You've got local government. Okay? You've diffused power. You, you've taken power from a central place and put it all in one person, and you've separated it, right? Okay? Why did the founders do that? Because they had an appreciation of the depravity of humanity, okay? In, in other words, anthropology, what does it mean to be human, precedes your political setup. In other words, the, the ancients, um, the Old Testament talks about this. The founders understood this, and William went. William Rehnquist understood this, that you have to look at Christian realism. We live in a fallen world, so it's fallen. Humans are sinners. So by golly, if you're going to set up a system of government, you had better separate the powers. Because if not, absolute power corrupts absolutely, like Lord Acton said, and, and somebody will become a king or a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And it'll all accumulate like, like what's going on today. Right. <laughs> so much political power is accumulated in Washington. So much bureaucratic power is accumulated in Washington. You've ever heard the term drain the swamp? Yeah. Okay, the swamp creatures, all of that, we poke, and, but, but that's this idea that what has happened is the framers' constitution has been twisted up like a pretzel yes. such that the limited powers that it originally set up has been ignored and so much of it's accumulated from the top, okay? The framers, Rehnquist, Ancient political philosophers said, whoa, 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 whoa. you're ignoring something, uh, a bureaucrat. You're ignoring something, power broker in Washington. You're a sinner. Okay, here's how the founders looked at people, okay? Um, uh, government is people, and people are flawed. That's it. Government is people, and people are flawed. Yeah. And so people, because people are flawed... You got to set up checks and balances and what, what he calls auxiliary precautions. Okay, again, getting back to the famous section of Federalist Fifty One that I've quoted many, many times, and you've heard me. I'll say this is James Madison. Okay, um, what is government? But the greatest of all reflections upon human nature. That is very much an expression of the ancient conception of of anthropology. In other words, what is government? Government is should reflect human nature. Okay? What is government but the reflection of human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls would be necessary. Right? If we were perfect, 
We don't need government. We don't need policemen. We don't need jails. We don't need law courts. We don't need judges. We don't need jury trials. We don't need, right? Because, but because we're flawed, we need government. Right? That, that, that is a great example of that expression, okay? Is, again, anthropology precedes political philosophy. We have a nature. It's fixed and permanent. Humans will always be sent. A thousand, if the Lord tarries, wait, you know, the Lord doesn't return for a thousand years, guess what? Humans are still going to be sinful, okay? And so good political philosophy takes that into account, right? Um, I, I just finished a, a semester of teaching international relations, which I love. It was actually a nice break because after the election and that, I didn't want to think about domestic politics personally. I just was like, okay, I need to shift my focus right now, okay? And, and so it deals with between nations, okay? America and China, America and Iran. It's, it's a cool class, okay? And, and but, but one of the things we talk about is realism in that class. And of course... I tell, even though the textbook doesn't say it, of course, I, I say, listen, because they talk about realism, okay, but they don't take into account sin. But I say, guys, you, you can, in other words, China is not our friend, and Putin is not our friend, and the Mullahs of Iran are not our friend, despite all of what, okay, a realistic view of looking at the world is <laughs> the Mullahs are sinners, and Joe Biden is a sinner. And, and, and Donald Trump is a sinner, and Vladimir Putin. In other words, so, 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 so there's got to be this inherent suspicion of we're all going to be buddies and friends and sing Kumbaya, okay? Because there's a whole movement within uh, what's called liberalism, okay? Don't think so much political, but liberalism within international theory. Hey, if we can all just trade with one another, we're all going to be buddies, yeah. the world's going to be great, and globalism, rah, 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 okay? Yeah. Christian realism says, uh, hold on. Yes, it is better if we're trading with each other. In fact, what, another Churchill quote. It's better that people jaw jaw than wall wall. <laughs> In other words, it's better that people jaw talk yeah. before you start shooting each other. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, I would be a big proponent of that. Hopefully you would too. And trading with one another is a great thing. But, but Christian realism says, I don't care how much we trade with China. I don't care how much we trade with pick your nation. They're sinners, and we're sinners, and sooner or later, somebody's going to jack this thing up. So you better have a strong military. That's Christian. You, know, like you better have some means to defend yourself. Don't, like, d disestablish your military, because this side of eternity, human nature. Anyway, that, am I making my point? Do you understand that? So, again, so, because, again, this gets a little complex, but that's what that means. And, and hopefully, and, and you already think this way, whether you, whether you, phrased it that way or should okay and so you know thankfully again what i've said before was america founded as a christian nation okay descriptively yes prescriptively no every generation gets to choose what it wants that's how the framers set it up okay but thankfully the founders had enough christian influence that they recognize the sinfulness of man thankfully jimmy madison spent a year after college studying under um John Witherspoon studying theology to learn enough about human nature that he, when he crafted the, 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 the Constitution, he took that into account. Okay? Any questions on that or thoughts? Okay? If you truly understand the Constitution, the Constitution was designed by the founders to reflect the perfectly ordered human soul. If a soul is ordered, that's what the Constitution, that, that's how the separation of powers and all that is supposed to set it up. It keeps the, the soul of the republic ordered if, you, if it stays chained down to the Constitution. It will not go off the rails, okay? Just like your soul, your soul is supposed to be ordered, right? So you don't go off the rails. Have you ever gone off the rails in your soul? I know I never have, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so anyway, that, that's what that means. Okay. So, so what are we talking about in this chapter? Okay. Again, I, th I think sometimes if you summarize a little bit, it helps. Okay. Uh, the influence of Rehnquist's parents and his community and how it developed his conservatism. Okay. As you, you know, again, we're not going to talk about this long, but, you know, all of you are the product of your upbringing. All of you are the product of your parents. Okay. I remember growing up, my dad 
who worked in management, okay? Just, you know, I learned to not like unions, okay? I learned to buy America. I learned, okay, because my dad worked in the automotive industry and all that kind of stuff, and, and he dealt with unions and all that kind of stuff. So th there was more of a, a conservative strain within my upbringing, even before Jesus, of looking at, you know, uh, corporations are not a bad thing. They're actually good, and and you know, so which is more of a, a conservative type of a thinking, okay. And all of you had different upbringings, I'm sure, that had you picked up stuff from your parents, right? Good, bad, and ugly. Same thing, okay. Um, we'll, we'll talk about his theological beliefs. We'll talk about free market capitalism. A guy by the name of F. A. Hayek uh, very much influenced him. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about political theory, uh, federalism, when he clerked for Justice Jackson, and um, the Lutheran uh, theology that influenced him. Okay, so that's what we're talking about in this chapter. Again, we're not going to go long and deep because Sharina, she hit the long ball in this chapter. Okay, there, there's just a lot here. And, yes. um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Let me say this too, okay? As someone who knows a little bit more behind the scenes. The... The biographies written about William Rehnquist, if you go look at them, okay, that are out, if you go on Amazon, they are written generally by liberals who are trying to bash him, okay? So what Sharina was trying to do in this chapter is reveal the rest of the story, okay? Reveal the stuff that the liberals hid or tried to prevent from getting out that prevented a, a, a better picture of understanding. So... That's why there's so much detail in this chapter. Okay, she was she was conscientiously trying to show them, trying to show liberal writers, hey, you forgot this and you forgot that and you forgot this and you forgot that, and because of that, you've got an incomplete picture of him. Okay, one of the disappointments of the book is that we really wanted uh, Rehnquist kids to read the book and give a review. Okay, and we tried to personally talk to his son multiple times, who was a, an attorney, I think, in New York City right now, um, and they refused. They did not want to talk to us because they had gotten so burned by granting interviews with authors that were liberal that they thought were going to just, you know, honor their father, and because they bashed him, they would not even speak to us. I mean, Jim, the, one of the authors, you know, said, I will personally fly. He, he was actually going to personally fly to his office and stand outside the door and personally, and, and it just never, so anyway. So I'm just trying to give you the backstory. If chapter three is overwhelming to you to some degree, she was trying to get, okay, and now you know the rest of the story. Okay, that kind of thing, okay? Okay. Um, so, again, I'm not going to belabor this, but, you know, the, the, a, a big part of William Rehnquist is, is conservative family, okay, um, you know, raised in um, uh, southern Wisconsin, uh, suburb of Milwaukee, Shorewood was just, it was just a really conservative town, okay, and, and so it was hardworking, you know, Rehnquist understood the value of hard work and, you know, all, in other words, not sponging off of <laughs> the American people by living on the dole, okay, something that a lot of people are doing in America right now, the holdover of all this COVID relief, right? And if, if you've seen it in the news, I got, I got a recent um, email from uh, um, Representative Upton. It's been, in the, you know, they can't fill all these, you know, needs in our community for work. Because people are, uh, it's more profitable to sit at home. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a friend of ours whose 21-year-old daughter for the last year has gotten $600 a week. And she was a caddy. Okay, still getting the money. Okay, she's in college. There's no reason. Yeah. So Rehnquist and his upbringing was, no, that's, that's wrong. Okay, and of course... You know, when he was young, it was it was in the, the 30s when FDR was president, and FDR was radical, liberal, ra you know, radical government entitlement programs, you know, Social Security and all these types of things, government takeover of businesses, setting price controls. Uh, uh, FDR artificially set the price of gold based on what he wanted it to be on any particular day. Okay, if you want to read about this, read Amity Schley's book, um, The Forgotten Man. 
Amity Schleys, S-C-H-L-A-E-S, but it talks about this, okay? Just different, in other words, so Rehnquist and his family that were more conservative, like, okay, they didn't like any of this kind of stuff, okay? So just, again, I don't want to belabor this, but this was a big part of his upbringing, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, just real quick, just, okay, what is conservatism? You know, if I would ask you, what, what, what does it mean, okay? Let me say this. A worldview is all-encompassing, and it's an explanation for everything. So Christianity is an explanation for everything. What does it explain? Creation, fall, what's wrong with the world, how do you fix it, what are we supposed to be doing with our lives, right? Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, okay? Marxism is a worldview. It tries to explain everything. Marx very clearly said, I'm not just trying to change people's thinking. I'm trying to take over the world. He said that, okay? Political ideologies are a smaller version of a worldview, okay? They are not a worldview. But, but one of the things I stress in this book is theological beliefs, okay, affect your thinking. What you believe affects your thinking, right? What, what you think about God or don't think about God affects how you think. It affects your political ideology. It affects your values. It affects your behaviors, does it not, right? Isn't your thinking, isn't your lifestyle radically different since you committed your life to Jesus, right? And aren't people that you know that are your same age that maybe you grew up with that did not commit their lives to Jesus, isn't their thinking very, very different than yours? Isn't them, their behavior very, very different? In other words, belief affects behavior. Belief affects thinking. Belief affects values, <coughs> right? Okay? And, and so it's, it's all-encompassing, okay? So when we talk about ideology, it's a smaller, smaller subset of what a worldview brings. Does that make sense? Okay, it's not an expl explanation of everything. So conservatism is this idea that there are some principles that are fixed and permanent, and they don't change. And so to do life well, to live life well, to do politics, to do law, to do entertainment, to do whatever, you are more than welcome to move forward. You are more than welcome to advance. You are more than welcome to develop something and innovate and whatever, but you're always anchored to these fixed principles. Okay? So what's conservatism? Okay, this idea that um, there are prevailing social norms that are wise. Okay, that, in other words, there are, there are, and again, conservatives might be Christians, but some of them aren't. Okay, I read a book, oh, rats, I can't think of the name of it now. I think it's called The Conservative Sensibility by, is it George Will? I think it's what it is. He's an atheist. But if you read the book, you're like, you think like a Christian, bro. Okay, so, so in other words, you don't have to be a Christian to be a conservative. Okay, but, but this idea that there are some principles that are fixed and permanent, you don't change even as you move forward. Okay, um, a conservative generally likes, looks at the Declaration of Independence. Um, they look at the Constitution as, hey, that's fixed and permanent. We live within those bounds. Okay, we don't want to, um, we don't distrust I was. We don't want social engineering. Okay, we don't want the government to socially engineer and change people's thinking. That's a very conservative line of thinking. Okay, from a Christian standpoint, why would we not want the government to socially engineer and change people's thinking and manipulate us? From a Christian, huh? They take away our free will. Take away your free will. We're trying to take the blessed God. Okay, in what way? You, you're all correct. But again, I'm trying to tease this out a little bit and help us again. Remember going from thinking in bits and pieces and thinking in holes. Why would a Christian have a problem with socially engineering society? Okay, takes away our will, takes the place of God. When you're trying to socially engineer society so that we're all more equal, or one oppressed group suddenly gets pushed up above everyone else. What is the government seeking to do? 
is seeking to bring a form of what? Um, control and control, and how about maybe redemption? Right, mm -hmm. trying to bring justification perhaps to a previously marginalized group. All right, from a Christian standpoint, we're like, no, wait a minute, redemption happens at the cross. Right, right? we're going to celebrate communion this morning. Mm -hmm. That's where we're redeemed. We're not going to be redeemed by government. Right. Government is not cannot justify my lifestyle. Okay, I, my identity, my what I am, is 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 connected to God and who He says that I am. Right, that's where I find my identity, my justification in Christ, my redemption. A lot of modern government and seeking to social engineer is taking the place of God through trying to justify or trying to bring liberation through government. See, we would say we experience liberty in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. From a Christian standpoint, we understand the scripture in 2 Thessalonians. If you don't work, you don't eat. Okay. So, so, so we would have a very strong emphasis upon um, human initiative mm -hmm. in taking care of yourself and your family. Okay, we would look at going to the government and getting aid for something that I should do myself, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I, I'm trying to tie scriptural principles to conservatism. Okay, again, you don't necessarily have to be a Christian to be a conservative. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of conservative values are undergirded by Christian principles. Okay, so, so again, we would be very suspicious of the government trying to socially engineer anything. Huh? That's basically what Fenton did. In what way? I mean, I know he did. What, what do you mean? Was, was that an example? Everything that you just explained is what Hitler did. What Hitler, Hitler did. Trying to um, socially engineer and, and culturally engineer. And came across initially saying that, you know, he was all for equality. We're going to take the oppressed and equalize them. And, and that's not at all what happened. It's, it's you know, and getting rid of the lesser inferior race. I mean, it's just, I, I think, yeah, he, I he don't, explained is what Hitler, what the, Hitler did. I don't know if he initially came across as trying to make everyone equal because he was already a rabid anti-Semite mm -hmm. from his days in 1910s, 1920s. But the people initially trusted and believed in him and trusted him and, and believed that they he was their savior. Well, and a lot of these, because of, the, the Deutsche Mark had collapsed. The whole nation, because of, of the Versailles Treaty, the World War I Treaty, basically bankrupted them. And so the whole nation was basically just falling apart. You know, you've heard the example. Women would literally take a wheelbarrow full of Deutsche Marks to the market in the morning because they knew if they didn't, by the afternoon they would need two wheelbarrows. Because, in other words, the value of the Deutsche Mark was just, inflation was insane. So Hitler comes in and, hey, I can bring order and the whole nine yards, yeah. And not, not to mention all of the other social engineering, you know, you know, Birkenau, Auschwitz, mm -hmm. um, the Aryan race. Interestingly, Hitler, his initial, one of his initial solutions to the final solution was not the death camps. He was going to send everyone to Madagascar. Kind of interesting. Just leave them there. But anyway, that's another. Okay. Um, so, you know, political ideology of conservatism you know, you preserve traditional morality, okay? You use the power of the state to preserve what is moral. So even as we, even as a conservative <laughs> Protestant would have a big problem with the government foisting SOGI laws and HR5 on the nation, we would want the state to, you know, what do I say? Preserve traditional marriage, mm -hmm. right? Preserve, you know, n not preserve a traditional view or, or a biblical view of what it means to be human. So, so we would say, no, you, you, you cannot uh, do surgery on perfectly healthy uh, teenage body parts because somebody suddenly wants to transit. In other words, they, they would want to use the state to preserve traditional morality. Okay, so, so I want to be fair even as a conservative Christian would look at a progressive trying to use the government to impose 
we also value the government, well, imposing, if you will, or at least maintaining tradition, hold the line, right? We would say hold the line, okay? So I, we gotta be fair about that, okay? So, so we cannot demonize progressive Christians or progressive people for trying to use the government to get their ends across. We advocate it too, do we not? Yes, yes we do, okay? But again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's upholding traditions, values, that we consider fixed and permanent and they should not change, okay? Um, a conservative would embrace free market capitalism. We would have a big, why would we have a big problem of the government taking over the US economy? Why would we have a problem with Obamacare, okay? Or the Affordable Health Care Act, if you prefer, where the government basically nationalized one sixth of the US economy? from a Christian standpoint. Again, I'm trying to help you think Christianly about this, not politically, but, but from a biblical standpoint. Part is taking away our choice. Taking away our choice or free will. So from a biblical standpoint, we understand free will. It makes us what not else? dependent on them. We have makes us dependent, dependent upon the government, the government that we can't move than ourselves. Freely. Okay, mm -hmm. here's the Christian pushback. Yeah, but what about the, the, the biblical charge to care for the needy and those that cannot care for themselves? Isn't Obamacare a very compassionate act to help people that cannot afford health care? No, because if you understand Obamacare, it doesn't help you at all. In fact, you're paying more for it than you would for anything else. You have no. Freedom. But Jesus said to care, you know, to care for the sick and the the hurting. Jesus that's cared a for, the sick. for the church, not the government. Right. There you go. Yeah. Then, that, that's what yes. I wanted to get at. Yeah. Yeah. Is that we we've got to make that we've got to make that distinction. Okay, we would be all for compassion, caring for people, helping for the downtrodden, the, the widow, the orphan. Okay. But we would say it through the church. We would not say liberation or freedom through government. Right. That, right. And yes. when did that shift? That shifted in the 1930s with the New Deal. Mm -hmm. Because of the Great Depression, suddenly now everyone's, whoa, I guess, hey, I guess we got to do that. I guess the federal government's got to get into the welfare business. Okay? And it, the church, everyone was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, financially deprived. But, but that's when the, when the shift began to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not trying to pick on the church in the 1930s, because put yourself in their shoes. What would you do? How would you do it? But there's, we've got to be careful as Christians that we don't unwittingly punt to the government and say that it is our savior when it comes to providing health care or, or anything else, right? That, because, okay, I might be controversial here, but, but just take Social Security. I would be much for scrapping that and allowing your 22-year-old or whoever's entering the job market, the money that you would put in that, put it in a retirement account. Mm -hmm. There would be much more money in my retirement account today than what I'm gonna get and probably what you're gonna get. I, I remember vividly my professor at ORU, I took a grad school class in investing. Didn't help me because I'm not a millionaire. But but anyway, but, but he, he told us, this was 19, he said, uh, uh, hey, all of you young people, don't plan on getting an ounce of Social Security because the system will be bankrupt by the time you go and ask for it because it was never set up to sustain people that way. It's like a, they, they call the baby boomers, maybe some of you are the rat and the snake. They're the rat going through the nation. And but by the time this big glob gets retired, give me, and it's going to extract all the money that's in the system. Case in point, 75 million baby boomers are retiring going like this, and they're right in the backs of 43 million Gen Xers like me. 70 some million trying to live off of 43 million. You, you see what I'm saying? Anyway, so, so as Christians, we would, we would look at, if you don't work, you don't eat. We would look at the parable of the talents, and we would make connections. Again, it, Jesus did not say it for economic policy. But this idea of taking care of yourself and trying to do what you can and not relying on a government system. 
but we've become so beholden to it. Your average Christian, your average person, right? Here we are. Anyway, because what tends to happen with the government is once a program started, they never stop them. Right. They never stop them. If you know anything about Social Security, the, the thinking of FDR and his brain trust was, okay, the average American is only going to live to about 67 years of age anyway, because that's how longer they were living. So the thinking is, hey, all we have to do is support people for two years and they'll be dead. Well, guess what? People are living till how long now? Thank God. And, 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 F, and FDR, he actually thought that it would actually go away. He actually really thought that it would actually start dissolve by the 1940s and 50s and it would actually go away. But again, like most government programs, it's like Wheel of Fortune. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep, right? It's, it's always there. So anyway, any, any thoughts on this? Okay. Again. Well, look at all the abortions and that that they have allowed. Those would have been people that would have given back into exactly. the community and so they don't know how to do it properly they and only know how to get more power let's get yeah. this passed and keep it let's get this yeah i mean you know it. children are a heritage of the lord blessed is he or she <laughs> that has many you know the quiver full of them right this <laughs> what was social security in bible times your kids, right? right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this mm -hmm. idea is that in, in the book Freakonomics, okay, um, the author talks about this idea. And th these guys are um, economists and they're statisticians, but they actually wrote a really interesting book because usually most books written by economists are really boring. But he talks about that everyone was thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to have this, um, uh, oh, they call it, the, well, there's going to be too many people in America. We're not going to be able to support them. And he said, what we haven't realized is we've killed 60 million babies. And now suddenly those people that we were counting on to make Social Security work are gone. Yeah. So what is the government looking at now? Illegal immigrants mm -hmm. to let them in the country so they can start paying for this stuff. I mean, that, that, that's the dirty little secret that your politician is not telling you. Why do you think both Democrats and Republicans never want to deal with it? Because they realize if they dealt with it, you would totally defund Social Security. But you know, there's a problem with this. You know, it's like it's it's the law of un unintended consequences. So the illegal immigrants are not going to be able to work and give into the system. So how are they planning on if they're granted amnesty? Mm -hmm. And then now they can work, and now they can That's support right. a particular party whose name will be go, go unmentioned, mm -hmm. and they'll stay yeah. in power in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you grant amnesty to them, yeah. now suddenly they can get a job. Now suddenly they can work. Now suddenly they can start paying Social Security and all that kind of stuff. Right now they don't. But that's one of the... the in other words, because of, a, because of Roe versus Wade, right, the law of unintended cost, 60 million gone, now you have to go to a totally different way. It's, 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 mm -hmm. We need Jesus. We need, yes. we need statesmen. That's why I've said before, mm -hmm. we don't need another politician. We need statesmen. Mm -hmm. What does a statesman look like? This was a finer shower, right? Someone like a Winston Churchill, someone like an Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so, you know, somebody who loves the country and loves some of these principles enough that they are willing to, hey, I don't care if I don't get elected or not, I'm going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, those people are few and far between in our country, but that's what we need. Anyway, I know we got way off on that, but that's okay. Um, yeah. If you want the PowerPoint, just ask and I'll send it to you. You can't really see it, but this is this is kind of interesting. You know, you can see the difference between you know the right and the left, conservative, progressive, okay, and how they look at things. You know, the adult in the conservative standpoint is you're self-reliant. Okay, now, now when we start talking about these, I'm not saying these are biblical, because we are supposed to be self-reliant in the sense that we take care of ourselves. If you don't work, you don't eat. But we're all supposed to be humble enough to yield our lives to Jesus and not be so self-reliant that I say, I don't need God, right? So, but <laughs> the adult, self-reliant and vocation, okay? The adult under the progressive or left, fulfilled. That, that, that's a big difference. In other words, express yourself, be fulfilled, be happy. But anyway, I could go off on this. I'm not going to take too much time. But if you're interested in that picture, it gives a really good, I think, depiction of, you know, right, 
and left. Okay. In other words, the beliefs of on the right, you know, religion, theistic, organized, conventional. In other words, that'd be Christianity. Rights, others must not interfere. Okay, hands off, which would be, um, again, the, the Declaration of Independence. It says to secure these rights, government is instituted among men. In other words, you've got the right to life, property, right to believe in God. Government must get its hands off. Right? That, that's what that means. Okay. Um, we would look at the homeless as no work ethic, no sense of shame. Hey, get a job. Okay. Is that biblical? It can be, but there's got to be compassion, too. You have to have both. If you don't work, you don't eat. Okay. In other words, conservatism disconnected from Christianity can be heartless. Right? It, it can be. Yes, it can. Get a job! You know, you're 28 years old living in the basement. Hey! <laughs> it's the dad doing that, okay? But interestingly, look at the left. Okay, religion. Do it. <laughs> Scientific, okay, so in other words, science becomes dominant, which was very much Harry Blackman. Um, not organized, unconventional. Um, rights, others must observe, okay? In other words, for conservatives, rights are negative rights. Government, stay away, okay? Um, the rights of progressives, others must observe my rights. I am a woman trapped in a man's body. And you must honor me, and you must observe me, and you must let me into your bathroom, and you must let me on your sports team. Okay, that's very much a left-leaning type of thinking. Again, very different. Beliefs affect your values. Beliefs affect your thinking. Beliefs affect your political ideology. Okay. Um, Homeless, okay, there's the conservative, no work ethic, get a job, okay. <laughs> Left, downtrodden, they're victims. Oh, the spirit of victimization is big within that. Okay, so, so anyway. Um, okay, society for conservative, again, this is how, not- Excuse me, how can they be a victim when they, they won't go out and get a job? How can they be- Because you're not considering their circumstances. They didn't have a mom, or they didn't have a dad, or they got a divorce, or they're on hard times, or their boss treated them bad, or... There's some sort of excuse and reason for all of it, mm -hmm. and that justifies their behavior. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because they're actually victimizing even the... Um, with the immigrants, they're victimizing them. They're bringing them in to use them, yeah, right. but yeah. um, in reality, they're... They're suffering so many things on the way, right? And it's they're just victimizing. Yeah, okay, you're going to vote for us in the future. Yeah, the ones that made it. One of the premises of progressivism. Okay, again, remember we talked. Mm -hmm. We began this whole discussion about anthropology. What does it mean to be human? Conservatives. Okay, biblical standpoint. We're sinners. Mm -hmm. Okay, from a progressive standpoint, we're not sinners. We're basically good. So what corrupts us? Society corrupts us. Institutions, institutionalized racism. Institutionalized uh, 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 patriarchy. Institutionalized whatever, right? I'm a victim of the system. Because again, human nature is basically good. And we talked about this last week. A lot of this has to do with a guy by the name of Rousseau who was a French philosopher in the 1700s, who wrote the book, The Social Contract, who begins his book, man is everywhere free. I'm sorry, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. So his thinking, and again, this is very much the left. <laughs> Rousseau was basically your first hippie. Is this idea that you're born free. Uh, human impulses, whatever impulses you want, are good. Whatever, whatever. I mean, I really mean whatever. However, what messes you up is the externals of the church, tradition, the patriarchal family, whatever, okay? So, 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 so if something happens to me, it's not because I'm a sinner, because I'm basically good and my human impulses, whatever, are good. What hurts people is we are a victim of external institutions or whatever. That is very much a left-leaning, okay? 
from a biblical standpoint. You see where once your, once your anthropology gets off, you get really, really off. Okay, so in other words, this is really not complicated. And all of you know this. All of you know that we're sinners. And, and I'm trying to show you how understanding that you're a sinner can really help you understand the best way to do politics, the best way to do law, the best way to do medicine, the best way to do whatever. Because if suddenly we're not sinners and humans are basically good, you get a Joseph Mengele as your doctor. And if you know anything about him mm -hmm. in World War II, you don't want him as your doctor. Okay? A total rejection of humanity being sinful, a total rejection of God, and you get a doctor that experiments on people cruelly and doesn't help people. Hippocratic Oath, totally forgotten. Okay, so, so again, th that's why this is anthropology. What does it mean? What are, human are we basically sinful or are we basically good? The left view of government is this assumption that humans are basically good. And we've already talked about progressivism in Woodrow Wilson. You can give more and more power to the government. You can give more and more power to bureaucracy. You can create something like the IRS. It was created with, with Wilson. You can begin to create all these huge bureaucracies, the Federal Reserve System, and all these systems that are not accountable to the American people because humans are now good. They reject it. Progressivism, political progressivism, is an intentional rejection of the founders. It's an intentional, again, Woodrow Wilson said this in giving a speech in 1911 about the Declaration of Independence. He said, if you want to understand the Declaration of Independence, forget the preface. Well, what's in the preface? Mm -hmm. Laws of nature, nature's God, inalienable rights, government derives their just powers from the consent of the governed. Have we consented to create all of these agencies? No, mm -hmm. oh, that's very Wilsonian. That's very <laughs> progressive. That is very much a changed anthropology. Humans are good now, so we can give more and more power. We can begin to start what they call abrogating or irrigating power from the local and state governments and give it to Washington. As I tell my students in my government class, America at its founding looked like a svelte Luke Skywalker. America today in the 21st century looks like Jabba Duhat, a bloated, blobby thing. And, it, and why is that? At the root, no, there's a lot of things, but at the root, a changed conception of human nature, what it means to be, we're not sinners. So we can give the bureaucracy more power because they will do a better job. Why? Because they're disconnected from the people. They're disconnected from the strife of politics. They're neutral. They're competent. They got PhDs. They'll make better decisions than your elected representatives. That's the logic of all of these agencies. That's the swamp, people. That's why we have all these swamp creatures. And they're unelected. You can't remove them even if you try. It's why every president that's tried to attack them has elicited the ah from them. That, explain, that explains four years of all the craziness with Trump. Okay, Trump did enough stuff that was kind of goofy and, but, 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 you know, as far as Twitters and all those, but, but I mean, he really tried to clean that thing up. Yeah. And that's why you had all the squawking. Mm -hmm. Because the, the squawk creatures do not want to go. Mm -hmm. They're still squawking against them. Right. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, any other questions on this before we get to hit, um, uh, we haven't gotten his religious convictions, okay? No questions? No thoughts? Okay, so moving on, okay, what, again, what were uh, Rehnquist's religious beliefs, okay? He was raised in a congregational church with a Puritan heritage. Okay, what is a key part of Puritans? Utter depravity. Okay, they, they probably have a much better conception of sin than probably we do. Is that at the fall, man, everything got jacked up. Okay, so, so because of that, Rehnquist, from his core, every time he did Supreme Court you know, decision making, and he understood humanity is sinful. And so he was very, very reluctant to side with the government in taking rights away from the people. He was very reluctant that... He, he, he rarely, if ever, held that the government is supposed to step in and fix people's problems. The national government. He said, hey, if you want to decide that at the state and local level, make the decision through your elected representatives. But the federal government, we are not the social engineer. 
And a big part of that was his Puritan heritage where he felt that human, utter depravity, we are sinful. Again, I cannot stress that enough. I know that, that seems like Christianity 101, but if you forget it, if you forget it, okay, it leads to, well, the, the ultimate end is some form of communism. And 100 million body bags later, you can see where that goes. You know, it's not, not good. In the 20th century, about 100 million people were killed under communism. Um, so, I'm not going to belabor the point, but again, he, he had a conservative Christian viewpoint, but again, much more subdued, much more reserved, congregational, okay? In his church services, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, okay, things, things of that nature, that we are what's called a non-creedal church. I don't know if you know that. In other words, we're not going to rattle off the Apostles' Creed every single Sunday or the Nicene Creed or something if you're for more of a, uh, uh, what's the word I want to say? Uh, a more reserved or, or, or uh, traditional uh, Christian viewpoint. But this was a big part of it. And the thing about Rehnquist is he was really good at memorizing. He, he could memorize. He, he won an award. He, he was the first in his class in, in Sunday school to, to, to memorize all of, of Exodus 20. Okay, so the guy from me. So, so one of the connections we make in this chapter, and Sharina makes this connection, and I agree with it. Given his penchant for memorization, it was not out of the question to assume that this guy most likely memorized the Nicene Creed, memorized the Apostles' Creed, and had that embedded in him as he grew up later in life. Um, there was a book that I read. Um, that w one of the few really good books about Rehnquist by his friend, uh, his name is Obermeyer, is his last name, he was a Jewish guy, that Rehnquist, after the death of his wife, befriended him, and they played tennis together. And they would rattle off lines from Shakespeare. And uh, in the book, I mean, they showed the stuff that they would just rattle off back and forth. They were really smart guys. So, so what am I trying to say? Because of his penchant for memorization, it is not unrealistic to expect that he internalized a lot of this stuff, and that was a big part of his life. But, again, don't think of him as a Baptist Christian or an Assemblies of God Christian. He was not that kind. He was much more of the, you know, again, how do I phrase them? You know, think congregationalists, think, think you're Puritans, and things like that. Okay? So, anyway. Mainline denominational. I mean, I was in a Lutheran church too, and I could probably still say the apostles. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting is he 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 was most likely born again, okay. And later in life, when he couldn't find a good congregational church in Washington D.C., he went to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is actually a pretty progressive liberal branch. Okay, but what he said in one of the books that we did research on was, because they asked him, how can you, in fact, his friend, his Jewish friend, was like, how can you stay in this, you know, knowing how conservative your viewpoint is? And he said, he said, I was raised in this, this is what I'm comfortable with, and I am strong enough in my faith that I can stay faithful to Jesus no matter what, despite how liberal it is. Okay, that's the rare Christian that can do, but he chose to do it through the very end of his life. The very end of his life which is there's two strains um the the church that he grew up in the congregational church became a um oh goodness I can't forgive me here i had the name down um the, does anyone remember the congregational church in the 1950s became sorry the name escapes me but a very, very liberal church that today embraces gay marriage and all kinds of stuff, okay? His mom ditched that church and said, I'm, I'm out of here, okay? Um, and so did Rehnquist. But, but he did stay in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Doc, were you in the Evangelical Lutheran Church or was it Missouri Synod? Missouri Synod. Yes. Missouri Synod is a more conservative version of the Lutherans, okay? So uh, kind of interesting. But, I, you know... Let me just read this section from the book because this gives you a, a pretty good idea of what he believed, okay? Um, he certainly would have understood as a worshipful Lutheran in his adult life, um, as far as um, he would have understood uh, that mankind used to be free and used his free will to disobey God, that the resulting sinful state of rebellion led to the plight of humanity, 
He would have known that God judges sinful humanity, that all people die and face final judgment. Um, he would have known that the central message of Christianity is hope. He studied the new covenant as the fulfillment of the old, that God instituted with man through Jesus Christ, offering forgiveness and eternal life. He would have known that such truth claims were incompatible with other worldviews such as secularism, naturalism, polytheism, and other world religions. Okay? A big part of Rehnquist was covenant. Okay? Many times in his Supreme Court decisions, he would use the phrase, we are to be keepers of the covenant. Judges are to be keepers of the covenant. That's very much puritanical. Okay, the Puritans understood the old, that the old covenant, um, as the old covenant bound the people of God to God and his word, so is the Constitution. The Constitution binds all future generations to what it says. So judges are not free to manipulate it and change it and mess with it. They're, they must be keepers of the covenant and honor that. Okay. When he said that, that's very much his theology and how a good Puritan would think and not so much how a good Assemblies of God pastor would think. Not that we don't value the covenant, but he very much, you know, words, who says that? Who uses the term covenant in Supreme Court decisions? Somebody who had that theological background. Okay, when when the early state constitutions were written in the 1700s and the 18 or the 1600s, 1700s in America, they referred to them as covenants or constitutions, and it was reflective of the old covenant. Okay, so so again, that, that was a big part of his theological thinking. Okay, any, any thoughts on this? Nothing. Okay, let me just stress this as I close. It's just again. Think of him as having conservative beliefs, but not falling into the what we would consider a, a, a Christian within the, again, Baptist or Assemblies of God tradition. Okay? Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. That's going to be it for today. Take care, everybody.